Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. It's Open Line First Monday. It, this is the, uh, the episode of the month when your phone calls and emails are a, an especially important part of our program. I bring back for this program either uh, someone who's all, all their life been a Catholic or in this case, usual, as usual, I'll bring back someone who's already been on the Journey Home program and shared their journey with you, but now they're back to answer more of your questions. Our guest tonight is Mark Brumley, the president of Ignatius Press. Um, before I go any farther, let me give you the phone number right off the bat, 1-800-221-9460. I'd like you to start calling right now if you've got any questions for Mark. The questions can be on any aspect of the journey of following Jesus Christ home to the church. And Mark is here as our resident apologist for the, <laughs> the evening uh, to talk with you, uh, to answer whatever questions you have. If you have an email you'd like to send to Mark, you can send it at journeyhome, one word, at EWTN.com. Mark, welcome back to the Journey Home. Well, happy to be here, Marcus. It's been a couple years. Yeah, it's been a while. At least. Uh, sometimes when I'll sit down with Jim Anderson, who's uh, my associate who does the planning for the program, and we'll think, who are we going to have for an open line? It amazes us when someone has been here for years and how we let Mark slip through the cracks for so long. I, I have no idea. <laughs> but you know, in, in a sense, this is an uh, opportune time for you to be here because isn't it the 20th, 25th anniversary of Ignatius this Press? This is Ignatius Press's 25th anniversary, and we are delighted. Uh, we've been able to serve the Lord for 25 years, a quarter of a century. Uh, Father Fessio founded Ignatius Press 25 years ago. He's still the editor, even though I'm the president, he's the editor. He's <laughs> off in Florida a lot with Ave Maria mm -hmm. University, but we're still, uh, still alive and uh, serving Christ. And my hope is that later we'll have a chance for you to bring us up to date on the state of Catholic publishing today and uh, maybe answer a couple questions about that uh, as the audience sees fit. There's a lot going on. That's right. But let's begin, as we always do in open line, to give you a chance to summarize your entire life's journey <laughs> in about five minutes. I was born. <laughs> <laughs> no, I come from South St. Louis, Missouri, uh, sort of a, I like to call myself a, a non-affiliated theist, South St. Louis non-affiliated theist. That was my background. I was from an unchurched background. Very, very uh, good moral upbringing. Believed in God, but didn't know much about the God I believed in. Let me ask you real quick. Sure. Uh, a non-affiliated theist. Theist, right. Theist. Just somebody who said there's a God. Okay. Uh, question right off the bat. Um, is this because your parents and their parents and the parents before them were in that same line? My parents, yeah, my parents were unchurched. Their okay. parents had a Catholic background, interestingly enough, um, but my parents were unchurched, okay. and you know they were good people and and believed in God, but didn't really give me any specific right. Christian tradition or religious upbringing. Okay. And so that's really where I came from. And I was a searcher, and uh, when I was in high school, I uh, had a conversion experience. I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, as we say in an evangelical context. Uh, the God uh, whom I believed in, believed existed, I, c I came to know in a very concrete and tangible way. Uh, I, you know, God was provident working in my life. Interestingly enough, I became such a Christian in the context of a militantly anti-Catholic <laughs> fundamentalist church. <laughs> so uh, it was the idea that the Catholic church would even be considered a Christian church was ridiculous to me. I, and I came in, in in the 70s, during, I, I could say, I came in at the tail end of the Jesus movement. <laughs> and uh, in the Midwest, you know, we were a little behind the times, you know, California had the Jesus movement in the early 70s. Well, it really hit us in the mid 70s. And that's when I became a Christian, a fundamentalist Christian. And really, um, I decided that I wanted to serve the Lord and I wanted to be his disciple. And it was really kind of a radical thing. And so my commitment to Christ led me to, to, to say, well, you know, how do I be faithful? What did what is Christ revealed? What is the truth? Where's the true church? And I went through a number of denominations. I went to a Baptist church for a long time. I was pretty hardcore. And then I started reading C.S. Lewis. And Lewis gave me a sense of the larger vision of the church. Yeah. And um, that really made me ask the question, what is the church? Where is the church that Christ founded? And uh, after being a Methodist for a while and studying the Church Fathers, I came to the conviction that the Catholic Church was the fullness of Christian truth. Um, the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church alone. And interestingly enough, people often say, 
well, what, you know, especially my fundamentalist friends sometimes will say, well, what led you away from what they would regard as true Christianity in the, into the Catholic Church? And even those who regard Catholicism as a form of Christianity, uh, you know, often wonder, well, what made you do that? And, and I say, well, yeah, there were specific doctrinal issues that I had to work through, you know, uh, the inadequacy of sola scriptura, the standard list, uh, you know, where was, where were the Protestant churches in the first 1,500 years of, of Christian history, that sort of thing. But really for me, what was key was the idea, where can I be fully a disciple of Jesus Christ? That's what it was all about. So I wanted to know what was the truth in terms of doctrine out of fidelity to, to Christ. I wanted to know, you know, how should I be baptized? What should happen in, in Holy Communion? Uh, are there ministers? Are there priests? Out of fidelity to Christ. Because if Christ set up a particular structure in the church, if I want to be a true disciple of Jesus, I want to want to be in the church where that structure exists. And so I, I came to the conviction after a lot of study and reading people like Chesterton and Frank Sheed, uh, folks like this, that the Catholic Church was that church, the fullness of the church that Christ founded. And that uh, in order to be faithful to Jesus, I had to be part of that church. So it wasn't Jesus or the church, it was Jesus in the church. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, uh, your, your conversion, which was now about 23 years ago, yeah. 20 plus years ago, right. uh, is interesting in a number of aspects because uh, it does predate an awful lot of, of us, mm -hmm. the rest of us who have made this journey home to the church. Um, so you converted right at about 1980. Right. You converted when I was in seminary, trained to be a pastor. Um, and a lot has changed. Mm -hmm. A lot has happened in the last 20 some years, good and bad. Uh, some which might be discouraging to your journey in, in the church, maybe even uh, uh, putting into question things you think you'd found, mm. find when you came into the church. Uh, some might even say, are you, what are you doing still here <laughs> after 20 years? But that's being a bit too sarcastic because you and I both know there's a lot of great things in this church. Right. And, uh, but talk a bit about that. 20-some 20, 20 years, a lot that has happened in those 25 years. Uh, what have you found? Well, years. I mean, uh, a lot has happened. There's a lot that's changed in, in one sense. When I mentioned people like Chesterton, uh, people like Frank Sheed. Uh, these are people who were writing really in the 20s and 30s. Sheed just died about, I think he died in 81, 82, but really the heyday of yeah. Frank Sheed was back in the 40s and the 50s and so on. Well, the reason I mention those people is not because I was sort of a pre-Vatican II Catholic. I, w I was a I was, yeah. I encountered the Church of Vatican too, but the people who were doing really the, uh, yeah. the, the kind of a aggressive, energetic evangelization apologetics, were Sheed and Chester and folks like that. There were, there was not this uh, burgeoning uh, explosion of Catholic mm -hmm. apologetics at the time, and so I had to find my way into the church through through folks like that. Mm -hmm. Now, the, what's happened in the last twenty years or so? Well, we've seen all of these converts come in. We've yeah. seen a renaissance of Catholic evangelization, apologetics, people getting into the Bible, people s rediscovering uh, not only the classic apologists and writers, but a whole new generation of apologists and writers are emerging. Uh, sometimes people say to me, well, where did this come from? <laughs> and uh, I say, I have the answer to that. I know exactly where it came from. And some people will say, well, did it come from Carl Keating? Now, I want to tell you, Carl Keating has contributed a lot to the resurgence of <laughs> Catholic apologetics, but he's not the source of it. And of course, we'll say God is the source, ultimately, grace, of it, grace, and grace, grace and the Holy Spirit. But wh what can we pinpoint the human instrument? And I've got it narrowed down. It was a little gray-haired old lady in South St. Louis back in <laughs> 1977 who was praying for her children and her grandchildren who were straying from the church and she was praying that somebody would come along who could speak to them who could uh, preach the bible to them who could talk to them in a language that would allow them to hear christ in the teaching of the church mm -hmm. and she prayed her rosary every day and i'm convinced that humanly speaking it was that action that little old lady in, in south st louis <laughs> that has brought this tremendous resurgence. Yeah. You probably multiply that one yeah, lady right. by thousands who were doing it. Exactly. Because, 
I mean, this last 25 years, we, we, we show in this same time period, Mother Angelica, Absolutely. the sisters, EWTN, and, you know, it's kind of like the, the, the Catholic renewal that happened after the Reformation. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't that they were forced into a corner to make these decisions. All that renewal was being called for long before the beginning of the Reformation in Absolutely. the 15th century during this time. It helped shape it. The negatives help shape the positive, but the positives are there all along. We can still say that for the last 25 years. There's been a renewal Absolutely. that began before Vatican II, through Vatican II, and of course some of the negative results of a misinterpretation of Vatican II have led to this whole renewal also. Absolutely. I'm, you know, so when I look at the church today, people say, well, there's these scandals. And they are. And I, I'll tell you, I, I get as angry as anybody uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, about these things. But I want to tell you. I knew about all of that before I became a Catholic because when I read the history of the church, yeah. I knew these things happened. And that, that's, that makes no excuse. That doesn't justify any abuse or anything like that. But you look at the history of the church. It's always been this field where there are the wheat and the tares. And um, one of the biggest obstacles I had to becoming a Catholic was that Catholics seemed so, such poor Christians. You know, they didn't know the Bible. They, they didn't know, if you ask them to pray in an imp impromptu prayer, they didn't know how to do it, that sort of thing. They seemed uh, such poor Christians, and that, that was on, on, in one sense, that was on the positive side. On the negative side, you know, they seemed so worldly. I remember having the experience of saying, how can the Catholic Church be the church that Christ found? How can it be? Look at these Catholics. And I was thumbing through the Bible, and I came to Galatians and read the dirty laundry list of sins there, and I said, there's the Catholic Church right there in the Bible. <laughs> and you know what? I did an examination of conscience. I wouldn't have called it that, but I did an examination of conscience, and it dawned on me, that's the church I belong to because I'm yeah. a sinner. Yeah. And one of the reasons Christ established the church was as a hospital for us sinners. Yeah, we're, we are called and converted and transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, but we still sin. Yeah. And we are a, a pilgrim people in many senses of the word, and one is in the sense that we're all recovering sinners. The this time period of 25 years, let's just say back in 1975 on, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't really start there at any point, but mm -hmm. if we look at the last 50 years, also there's time as this, this, these converts coming into the church, and uh, uh, I just look at our database and the, our work in the Coming Home Network, it's estimated that after Newman converted, 400 mm -hmm. priests converted. We've got more than that in our oh, database yes. just in the last so if you want to call it a movement, it's really a work of the Spirit, but Absolutely. something's been happening. Um, what other things would you contribute to these, this renewal of the last 25 years, other than that fine woman's prayer? Well, I think, obviously, what's happened is there's been a pastoral need for Catholics to respond when, say, evangelical Christians raise objections to the Catholic faith, and Catholics have had to answer that. But there's just the whole uh, re resurgence of the faith that has been the result of people like Pope John Paul II. You know, John Paul II is a powerful witness. I, I really, in one sense, he's the first pope I really knew anything about, uh, because I, I mean, I heard about Paul VI, yeah. but he was he was really the icon for modern Catholicism. Here was this man who was a d dynamic witness to Jesus. Uh, there was no doubt about it that that he knew who Christ was, and he was a prophet of Jesus Christ in the modern world. And I think John Paul II has been a tremendous con con contributor. An impetus to to this resurgence that we've seen in the faith, uh, converts, evangelization. I think there's been a real renewal of Bible study and the study of the Scriptures, um, getting back to the roots of the Council. Uh, I know many of my friends who are actively involved in teaching theology now, really, uh, you know, oh, made the faith their own in the 80s, in the 1980s, partly in a resp in response to this vision of John Paul II, mm -hmm. partly in 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 response to this resurgence of, of study of scripture, but also just getting back to the documents of the Second Vatican Council, mm -hmm. a much neglected source of spiritual renewal in the church. Of course, the rise of the internet and all of that. And the well, the internet's been tremendous. Catholic been radio, amazing. Catholic TV, yeah. uh, Mother Angelica came on the scene in the early 80s, that alone. Yeah. I mean, she was just, um, you know, cr really created a revolution. And the fact that we can be on here talking about these things yeah. and we can mention 
things like, you know, I mentioned Carl Keating a, a few moments ago. He's a household name in, yeah. a, in a lot of contexts. Yeah. And that's partly due, I mean, I like to think that Ignatius Press had something to do with it, seeing <laughs> as I were his publisher, but also it's, it's due to people like Mother Angelica and EWTN that brings uh, really this Catholic renewal into the living rooms of people, you know, day in and day out. Okay, let's take our first email. We've got one already for you, and uh, I think it hits right on the spot of some things we're talking about. This, um, I think it comes from, I can't see it all in my little picture here, but it looks like it's from John, I think it's Sean, New Jersey. Um, Hi, Mark, I see that you were a Methodist before becoming Catholic. It seems that people are frequently leaving the church they are attending and going to another. Mm -hmm. What difference does it make where we go to church? unless it is that God wants us in a particular church to do what he is calling us to do there. Thank you for response. Thank you for your email. Well, that's a good, good question. I mean, the, the, first of all, we, I mean, the, in a sense, the question comes from a context where we Catholics would say, well, the Methodists are Christian. We would say that they have the Spirit of Christ and all kinds of good things there. So the question is, if, if the Spirit of Christ exists there, why would you want to be a Catholic? And I can sum it up in three things. First, the truth, the, the Word of God, the fullness of the truth, although we would say that you know our Methodist brothers and sisters have the gospel and so on, but the fullness of the gospel, yeah. we would believe, is found only in the Catholic Church. So if I want to be faithful to Jesus, I don't want to just be you know sort of the minimal of faithful I can be. I want the full Jesus, the whole thing, all the truth that God has revealed. So that's reason one. Reason two, the sacraments. The full means of grace in the life of worship, in the, li in the liturgical life that Christ has bequeathed to the church. Now, again, we believe that Methodists have real baptism, and I'm not here to diss the Methodists or the Baptists or anybody. I'm not here to criticize anything. Because we believe that they have elements that Christ has given to, to the church. But again, you want the fullness. If, if Jesus went to the trouble to give it to us, then we should go to the trouble to try to get the fullness of what he has given us. And lastly, the issue of authority. You know, I believe that Christ established the apostles, and Peter is the center of the apostolic college, and that there is a, an apostolic succession of authority that Christ committed to the church. And if Christ, wanted the ch if Christ went to the trouble to endow the church with these bishops, uh, whose genuine and full and authentic authority is rooted in communion with the successor of Peter, then I want to be in that church in all of its fullness. Now, that doesn't, I'm not trying to make light of all the issues, because yeah. there are a lot of them. There are a lot of good Protestants really struggling to live a Christian life. And, you know, in one sense, I, I often explain it this way, you know, going back to this important distinction in theology between the objective and the subjective. You know, objective is what is out there, what Christ has bequeathed the church, independent of what Marcus Grody thinks mm -hmm. or Mark Brumley thinks. It's what Christ has given the church. The subjective is my personal appropriation of that. You know, Christ died for everybody, mm -hmm. but if we don't appropriate that, it doesn't do a whole lot of good. You and I, when we were evangelicals, we used to preach that sermon very well, you know. <laughs> Christ died for you, it's like money in the bank. If you don't draw on it, it doesn't do any good. Well, Christ has bequeathed to the church the truth, the way, the life, in, in, in the word, in the fullness of the gospel, in the sacraments, and in the, in the authority, the apostolic authority in the church. He's bequeathed that to us objectively, concretely. Now, our call to be his disciples is to subjectively appropriate that, to make it our own, so that we live the fullness of the truth. We live the fullness of the life in, life in the life of the sacraments. We are under the obedience of our shepherds that Christ has appointed in communion with the successor of Peter. And so that's why it makes a difference what church we go to. You know, you, you mentioned those pillars, you know, the issue of truth and authority, mm -hmm. and it is so crucial. And I know that you've been a Catholic 20 plus years, I've been one 10 plus years. And that journey into the church um, really doesn't stop the moment we enter. You know, our continued growth and things. And I, I think right now, in fact, I even encourage the audience, those of you who are in touch with the news right now, know that um, some of our brothers, Christians, brother and sister Christians, and other Christian traditions are dealing with some very difficult issues this year. And what, what is amazing is that the issues they're thinking of accepting mm -hmm. are things we never would have dreamed right. 50 to 100 years ago that we would accept. And it's all, if you stand back and look at it, it's all an example of what happens when you cast aside that authority mm -hmm. that we have in the church through the Holy Spirit and in the apostolic succession. 
you throw that aside and you end up slowly spiritual entropy kicks in and slowly you start succumbing to the pressure of culture mm -hmm. and we're seeing it so many times around us and uh, as you said mea culpa you know we look at scandals in the church right. but for the grace of God go you and I right absolutely. but thank God for this church and the authority that will take a stand in the midst of cultural pressure right. the Church of Christ is holy the personnel of yeah. the church sometimes have a, you know we have a problem with We've got our first caller tonight John from uh, looks like Missouri I think Hello, well, John. What's your state? Yeah. <laughs> what, what's your question for us tonight? Uh, yes, uh, Marcus. My question is: uh, How did Latin become uh, the mother tongue of the church of the Catholic Church? I'll hang up and, and, and listen to you. Thank, Thank you. you, John. Good, great question. Oh, good question. Well, John, the answer is pretty simple. As Christianity spread from its Jewish original Jewish context, it moved out to what was a Greek-speaking world, but the official language. Uh, of the Roman Empire into which the Christians uh, penetrated and, and eventually converted was Latin. And so Latin became the dominant language in the church simply as a function of Christianity transforming the Roman Empire, the pagan Roman Empire. It's a fascinating story. You read the first 300 years, 400 years of the church's history, it's, it, it's as fast paced as any thriller. You know, when you look at the, the great saints and the martyrs and all of that and how they managed to take this hostile Roman Empire, which you know Jewish authorities were were fearful of, you know, and the, and we know the zealots and all of those wanted to do battle with. Well, Christianity, by the witness of Jesus Christ, went out into the world yeah. and transformed this empire, and that's why Latin to this day is the official language of the church. And it, in a certain sense, it's a testimony to the power of Christ to transform even the militant pagan Roman Empire. It is funny when you look at it from the standpoint that there in the beginning you have the apostles, the twelve, and around them it's starting to grow a little bit. But if you could imagine them having a mindset of setting up their little diocese <laughs> and their little parishes and, 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 and then only having kind of an inward focus on just Jerusalem. Yeah. Now what would have happened? About 40 years later after the death of Christ we'd have been wiped out because Absolutely. Jerusalem was wiped out. And so by God's grace if we hadn't had the inspiration to be spreading already mm -hmm. that Christianity would not have survived mm -hmm. the destruction of Jerusalem. That's a tremendous point, you know, and it, it reminds us that the church can never be satisfied with the status quo. The church, Vatican II, Lumen Gentium, Article One says the church is in Christ a sacrament, a sign and instrument of communion with God in the unity of human race. It's not just a sign of communion with God, but it's an instrument. It's, the, it's that which brings it about. So the essential nature of the church is evangelical, you know, with the small e. In other, in other words, it's mission-oriented to bring people into a saving union with Christ. And so we can never just be, you know, that church, as you described, sitting in Jerusalem, oh, let's just be preoccupied with our own concerns. Um, ask you a little bit more about your journey. Uh, for many of us, we study really hard to get into the church, go through all those doctrines that stand in the way, the rough ones, uh, and then sometimes when we come into the church, we think we we know it all, mm -hmm. or at least right. sufficiently. We've arrived, and then once we come into the church, we continue to study. We start discovering things we didn't even know before that even kind of put a, even a, a stronger stamp on this is why I'm Catholic. Mm -hmm. Was did anything like that happen for you in your journey? Well, a couple of things. You know, in, I wrote this book, How Not to Share Your Faith, and and I talk about the seven deadly sins of apologetics, and I said one of the deadly sins is we converts are especially prone to. And then as taking the, f our ar confusing our arguments for the faith with the faith for which we argue. And it's a real danger because <laughs> you study through these things and you know the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, boy I struggle with that. It sort of becomes my own when I develop the biblical case for it and it's mine. One of the biggest problems I think that I had was, was letting go and saying no this isn't, these aren't my doctrines or the truth that I've come to. This is the truth that Christ has bequeathed the church, and I accept it in faith, you know, and I, not just because I can find arguments for it, but there's a submission to, the, to God's word, which is being revealed. I think probably the biggest obstacle, and this is, you know, you're, you're not going to be shocked by this, Marcus, is Mar was Mary. <laughs> that was probably the yeah. biggest, biggest obstacle for me theologically. And um, there's a great story I like to tell about this. Uh, when I first 
prayed the Hail Mary. This was even before I became a Catholic. I felt like lightning was going to strike me. You know, just kind of <laughs> do this experiment and see what happens. And I prayed it. Lightning did not strike. But for the longest time, even after I initially became a Catholic, I felt real uneasy about it. And then about 10 years later, or actually about seven years later, I was teaching in a Catholic school. And I was teaching religion. And I was showing that, that wonderful film that Ricardo Montalban did on, on Fatima. Mm -hmm. You know, Ricardo Montalban went from the wrath of Khan in Star Trek to, uh, <laughs> to, to preaching Our Lady of Fatima, which is a pretty good conversion, right? At any rate, uh, I, I was showing this to the students. And at the end of that, there is a quote from our Holy Father who is, w is offering a prayer to Mary in thanksgiving for saving his life. He believes she was responsible for sh saving his life from the assassination attempt. And it's this wonderful prayer. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm there watching this with the students, and I felt a tear come to my eye, and I got really choked up. And it dawned on me that I had undergone an emotional conversion. You know, sometimes we're a little suspicious of these emotional things. <laughs> but I had initially been very, you know, uneasy. I, I went with the truth. I knew that the case for the intercession of the saints and the role of Mary was such that praying something like the Hail Mary or the Rosary was right theologically. But it took a while for my emotions mm -hmm. to catch up. And then it dawned on me, you know, some seven years later, here I am crying at this beautiful prayer that John Paul II utters uh, to Our Lady that there had been a transformation that it touched my heart. And no, now, the idea that I would feel uneasy about you know, asking Our Lady's intercession or anything like that is mind-boggling uh, to me. I, I can, if I try real hard, I can remember <laughs> sort of what it was like, but you become transformed. And the grace of Christ and the truth of Christ does that. Here's a phone caller that I think uh, is going to tag right on to your Great. statement. Margaret from Wisconsin. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Hello, Margaret. Are you there? Hello. Hello. Hi. What's your question for us tonight? Yes, I can hear. I can hear some backwashing. Oh, I, I don't know. What? Give us your question, though. What's your question for us tonight? Okay. Uh, you want me to say? Yes, it? please do. Oh, okay. You might turn off your TV volume. That might help just a tad. I turned that. Okay. What's your question for us? Uh, my question is. Where in the Bible does does it tell you that you have to pray through Mary? All right, great. That's thank you, thank you, Margaret. Or in the Bible, th this whole thing you've just talked about, praying to Mary, our whole fa Holy Father, praying to Mary. Where in the Bible does it reference it? Well, the Bible doesn't say you have to pray through Mary, but what the Bible does talk about is praying for one another. You know, Paul tells us to pray without ceasing. He tells us to pray for one another. The Bible makes clear that Jesus is our mediator. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. There's no doubt about that. The Catholic understanding of the intercession of the saints doesn't compromise that any more than uh, the Catholic and Protestant or an Orthodox understanding of intercessory prayer compromises the mediation of Jesus. We wouldn't say, oh, well, because we approach the Father through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that uh, it would be inappropriate for me to ask Marcus here to pray for, for, for me uh, because we would, we would say that Marcus isn't taking anything away from Jesus Christ. In fact, Marcus is, a, is enabled to approach God our Father through Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit because Jesus is the mediator. Well, likewise, with Our, with our Lady, she's in heaven, as are all the saints, and she's in perfect communion with God, and so she's able to approach the Father through the work of Christ, through the grace of Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not only that, she's able to do it more effectively because as it says in James 5, that the prayer of a righteous man is very powerful. Well, you can't get any more righteous than to be in the very presence of God, you know, because God is all holy and all perfect. So those who are in his presence are all holy and all perfect. So the intercession of the saints is firmly rooted in the biblical doctrine of intercessory prayer. That's where it's at in the Bible. We're gonna take a break, but before we go there, real quickly, they might see information on the screen about Campion College. Yes. So tell, us, tell the audience what all that is. Well, Campion College is a two-year uh, liberal arts Catholic program that we started in San Francisco after the demise. I'll call it the demise. I don't want to be uh, <laughs> too uh, controversial here of the, of the St. Ignatius Institute. Uh, and Campion College was founded by Father Joseph Fessio and John Galton. Father Fessio has moved on to Ave Maria in Florida, uh, you know, thanks to the Vatican. 
Um, but uh, Campion College c continues, and, and uh, we are located in San Francisco, California, two-year liberal arts program. And the idea is, obviously, you can't equip people in two years, give them a lifetime of learning and so on, really becoming a truly educated Catholic, rooted in the Catholic and the Western tradition, is a lifelong endeavor. But we can provide some fundamental tools, foundational tools. And w the, the idea is that students will then go on to other institutions. That's why we don't see ourselves as competition with the good Catholic institutions across the country, because many of our students are going to go on yeah. you know, to the Christendoms and the Ave Marias and, and, and so on. Um, however, many, many young people don't want to go for whatever reason to, to a Catholic college. They may want to go into a field that isn't, you know, th th they need to go to another secular institution to get that kind of formation. We want to make sure that they've been given the Catholic foundation so that when they go off those other institutions, they have the tools to distinguish the good and the bad, the true and the false, and to, to begin to be the Catholic, you know, get the training to be the Catholic attorneys and the Catholic lawyers and the Catholic physicists and all of these things that we're going to need in the future if the church is going to be effective in imbuing the secular order with the spirit of the gospel. All right, Mark. Thank you very much. Let's take a break. Get back just a moment with your questions for Mark. Any issue of the journey? We'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Our guest tonight is Mark Brumley, and uh, thank you for your phone calls and emails. We've got a few to select from now. In fact, there's an email sitting right in front of me. You ready for this one? Give it it a comes shot. from George in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Mark and Marcus, I would like to ask your, gu your guest on this, the feast day of the great saint and confessor, St. John Vianney, how he viewed the sacrament of reconciliation before he became a Catholic, and how he sees it now as an ardent supporter of the Catholic Church. Thank you, George, for your question. Ooh, very good question. Well, before I became a Catholic, I, I didn't know very much about it. What I did know about it, I didn't like. Uh, <laughs> it seems superfluous. Why do I need to go to a man to get my sins forgiven when I can go straight to God? Um, and I even thought that, you know, somehow there was, there was, this was a power grab by those Roman priests to, you know, find <laughs> out the details of your sin and, and that sort of thing. Um, after I became a Catholic, I or in the process of becoming a Catholic, I should say, I came to see that the Sacrament of Reconciliation is simply one important means that Christ uh, has endowed the Church with to bring about reconciliation between God and man. You know, John's Gospel, uh, Resurrection, our Lord, John chapter 20, appears to the disciples. And what does he do? He says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And so he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven whose sins you retain are retained. When I was an evangelical, I interpreted that, and you know how it was interpreted. That's preaching the gospel, right? Yeah. Well, what does Jesus mean when he says forgive sins? You might, if you, if you stretch it, <laughs> you know, pretty, you ch stretch it out of shape pretty much, you might say, okay, that's preaching. But what is this business about retaining sins? You say, well, that just means you don't preach to those people. That's not the same thing. And the agent there in John chapter 20 is the minister who forgives or retains. And that's the very thing that I found objectionable as an evangelical was the idea that a human being was given authority to forgive or retain sins. The only way that's possible is by the power of the Spirit. And interestingly enough, that's exactly what Jesus said. He says, the Father sent me, so I send you. Jesus wasn't sent just to preach. He was sent certainly to preach the kingdom. But he didn't just preach the kingdom of forgiveness. What did he do? He actually affected it. We know that one of the things, one of the obstacles to many of the people of Jesus' day, to Jesus, was the fact that he claimed to have the authority to forgive sins. So, as the Father sent me, so I send you, Jesus says, not just to proclaim, as important as that is, but also to affect the forgiveness of sins. And he gave that power to human beings, to men specifically, John chapter 20, when he breathed on them and endowed them with a share of the Spirit. All right, thank you. 
Uh, take a caller from Betsy in Pennsylvania. Hello, Betsy. What's your question for us tonight? Um, hi, Marcus. I'm a convert. I um, I loved your show, and it's been part of my journey. Um, I still am struggling with the um, with purgatory, and I can't seem to rec reconcile um, the teaching that's sort of been pounded into me as a Protestant evangelical of, you know, Christ died once for all, for all men, for all your sins, past, present, and future, and that's it. And now I, I'm trusting and believing in the teaching of the church on purgatory, and, um, but I, I just can't reconcile, you know, what I've sort of learned through the Protestant church and the issue of confession and um, reparation and... Um, you know, when I try to explain it to my, my Protestant friends, I kind of end up sounding like I believe in works. <laughs> Betsy, thank you very much. It reminds me that for many of us converts, maybe a large percentage, in certain areas we have to pray that prayer from Scripture, I believe, help my unbelief. Absolutely. We're still on the journey. We're always on the journey understanding, mm -hmm. especially when for 30, 40, 50 years of our life we had been taught mm -hmm. a certain way and often passed that along and believed it uh, without examining it, mm -hmm. we just accepted it. So, what's your answer to her on, you know, dealing particularly with purgatory? Mm -hmm. uh, well, what I would say, I, uh, for me, the the best approach from an evangelical perspective with respect to purgatory is to see, is to emphasize a couple of points. First, she mentioned the finished work of Christ. Well, we want to make clear that the power of the cross is so powerful that it, yeah. it, it powerful cross is so powerful. You're on it. The cross is so powerful that it can affect a kind of sanctification even after that. And really that's the idea of what purgatory is. It is a form of sanctification, of purification. And it doesn't happen uh, apart from the work of Christ. It is the work of Christ continued in the believer. When, when a person dies, if that per you know, person is in God's friendship and God's grace and communion with God, let's say, and in an evangel evangelical context these days, he's accepted Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior, and he loves Jesus, he really means it. Uh, that person still uh, may be uh, imperfect in many ways as a Christian. Uh, he needn't be, but he may be. And purgatory is simply the power of the cross in purging or purifying that person after death, if he, if he needs that. Now, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says that we are to strive for that holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now, the writer of the Hebrews, in that context, He's talking about the discipline of the Lord and undergoing the Lord's discipline in this life. But it's clear that he relates the, the sufferings and the trials that we experience in this life as a form of discipline and growing closer to the Lord to the idea of striving for a state of holiness, a measure of holiness. And you say, how can that be? If they're believers, aren't they in communion with God? Yes, they are. The temp we say the eternal punishment due to sin of hell, that eternal punishment has been done away with. But there's still a temporal punishment or, or purging, if you will, something that we undergo prior to entering the full communion in the very presence of God. And so that's really what purgatory is. And it shouldn't be seen as rivaling the cross. Rather, it should be seen as the work of the cross in sanctifying the believer uh, even beyond the grave. Yeah, there's, there's another part of this which is hard to tell our Protestant brothers and sisters, and that is that when they learned the doctrines that you and I learned, that, that Betsy learned, and become so indoctrinated with, you would want of a better term, mm -hmm. that w we didn't often know that the foundations, the assumptions behind those teachings mm -hmm. were ideas that didn't exist for the first 1,500 Absolutely. years of the church. And two that come right to mind originated in Luther himself. One was this idea of total depravity, mm -hmm. And that is that because of the fall, we are so depraved that there isn't anything we can do in this life that isn't tainted with sin. Mm -hmm. There's nothing we can do on our own that, that, doesn't, that, that can win approval of God. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the other one uh, is, um, oh, shoot, I'm getting Sola old. Sola Scriptura. So, well, Sola Scriptura. <laughs> but I was thinking about depravity and then this idea that um, we can't, you said it earlier, we can't choose. Right. We have the, the will, bound will of man. the bound will of man. Right. So not only are we totally sinful, but we are not free to choose God. Right. It is totally a gift. Right. And of course, Calvin ran with that to the total predestination. So all this comes to this idea of why 
Luther would then go to say, he died once and for all, right. he did it all for you, there's not a thing you can do, and that's ground into us, in those five spiritual laws, right. and, and it's hard to break free from that, but to do that, you have to almost go back and understand the Catholic understanding of sin, mm -hmm. Catholic understanding of the fall, the freedom of our will to choose, as you said earlier, to, uh, you know, God gives us this, but we have to choose it for ourselves. Right. You know, those are basic understandings that then help us get back to understanding how Christ can die for us all, yet, yet we have to choose it. Right, absolutely. Well, there's a Catholic balance, you know, uh, it, in, 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 put in Trinitarian terms, one God, three persons. We balance that out in terms of justification, getting right with God. We say, yes, it's all of grace, but there, but there is fr human freedom and there's human cooperation. The Catholic understanding of salvation, in a certain sense, again, I'm not out to, to, to attack Protestantism, but our understanding of salvation is, in one sense, more powerful in that we say the power of the cross is so great that it can transform us in such a way that we are capable, by grace, of cooperating. Now, which is more powerful? The work of the cross such that you remain, uh, your will remains bound, you're incapable of cooperating. Uh, you're a sinner till you die. Yeah, that's right. No matter. Or the power of the cross that can transform you in such a way that you can, by grace, cooperate and that you can, that God makes you an instrument through which he is able to affect the salvation of the world. See, that to me, that's much more, that exalts the cross much more prominently. That exalts the resurrection power of Jesus more significantly than the view that says, well, you just believe and you can't really do anything. You're stuck. You're a miserable sinner. You're a pile of dung covered by snow. All right, with that final word, <laughs> <laughs> on that upbeat <laughs> note. Reminding me I have a barn at home that's cleaning. That's but right. let's go to this next email, which is timely. It's probably something we shouldn't avoid. It's from Stephanie in Houston. Hi, I would like to hear your comments regarding the upcoming vote reference the gay clergyman becoming an Episcopal bishop. I find the fact that this is even be being considered frightening. Here's a question. Would the Catholic Church feel pressured to do the same? Well, I don't, know, I don't know whether the church will feel pressured to do the same. I assume on a human level that that will be the case. But in point of fact, the Catholic Church will not do this. Uh, homosexual acts are in and of themselves gravely sinful and disordered. And the idea that we would, uh, that anybody would be ordained to a position of leadership in any Christian church or denomination or ecclesial group who uh, engages in, in such a behavior and an is an open uh, defender of such behavior is just absolutely inane. And it's, it's really something that, you know, we, we thought back in 1930 that the Anglican Communion was going the wrong way in rejecting contraception. And some people make an argument that what we're seeing here is the, the working out of the logic behind that. But now we are, we're at a point where uh, this, is, this is very serious. And, uh, you know what scares me? Disaster. I remember when I got my driver's license many years ago, and I went out to buy gas, and it was less than 50 cents. Mm -hmm. And the thought of it becoming 50 cents, 75, I couldn't right. believe it. Incredible, right? Right. And then the gas companies put it up to a dollar. Ah! <laughs> then we were happy with 50. Mm -hmm. Then they took it to 100, the dollar 50, and we were happy with a buck. Right. Then they took it over two dollars, and now we're happy with a hundred with a dollar 50, right? Well, sadly, that's happened to us huh? in our culture with these sins that we would never dreamed of accepting 100 years ago. Yeah, and this isn't just looking the other way. This is saying promoting to someone, someone to a position of leadership in a Christian church who is in a homosexual union and actively engaged in homosexual behavior. Uh, you know, I'm not out to attack this particular individual or I'm not getting on a bandwagon against the Episcopal Church or anything like that. Just simply saying this is diametrically opposed to the teaching of the scripture and certainly the Catholic tradition. The operative question being, who determines yeah. what is true? Is it a denominational vote? Right. Who determines what is true? Our culture? I mean, this is what you're seeing on the news right now. To look at that and seeing how is truth being determined? Mm -hmm. yeah, and it's not doing anybody a, 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 a service. No to muddy the waters on this, you yeah. know, uh, it really yeah. is not doing the cause of Christ any good. Right. Let's take our caller, Aaron from Virginia. Hello, what's your question for us? Hi, Marcus and Mark. Aaron, hello. Um, first, I'd like to say that we really enjoy your show. Thanks. Along with my parents in Mississippi, we never miss it. My question Thanks. is, 
could you recommend one book that you would give to an inquiring non-Catholic to educate them about the church? Oh, well, this is a wonderful novel called How Firm a Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, what would you say? Because oh you, you are a publisher of great Catholic books. Well, I, I, a lot of it would depend on you know where the non-Catholic is coming from. Right. Uh, just an overall introduction to, to the Catholic faith. I would you know I would say really on a popular kind of apologetic level, it would be Peter Crape's Catholic Christianity, yeah. or Fundamentals of the Faith by Peter Crape. Both of those are very yeah. good entry-level books. If you're talking about someone from an evangelical background, probably evangelical is not enough. I think that would be. Good Wonderful place book. to start. Tom Howard's book, yeah, right? Tom, Tom Howard's right. book. Um, uh, if you're looking for uh, something that is more geared towards the anti-Catholic fundamentalist, I'd say Carl Keating's Catholicism, Fundamentalism, Dave Curry's Born, Fundamentalist, Born yeah. Again Catholic. Who should vote for his father. You know, that's right. Those are all very good books. And what makes them so powerful is that they get into the mindset of the reader who is a non-Catholic. And they try, they express the Catholic faith in terms that these folks are going to be uh, more inclined to be able to accept or understand, and they anticipate a lot of the questions people will have. So I would recommend those books very, very highly. And I do encourage you, if you're thinking about what book do I give, first of all, it helps, you really need to know them, the person, right. and what kind of books do they like what, in general, what do they read? I mean, that's why I wrote a novel, because I want to read people that only read novels. But if they are the kind that can diligently look at a non-fiction, mm -hmm and they're interested in scripture, or well, there's great scripture books. You know, Ignatius Press is putting out some wonderful uh, the, the study Bible that you're mm -hmm. working Ignatius on. Ignatius study Bible. Yeah, I mean, so there, the stuff's out there. And, uh, but also, the number two thing is that read it yourself first Absolutely. to know whether it really will match with your friend's interests. The only way you'll know that is don't take our word for it, is read yeah. it yourself. So, just got another caller, Judy from Louisiana. Hello, what's your question for us? Uh, well, first I want to thank you for your show. It's you. really most interesting tonight. Um, it's my understanding that uh, John Wesley, who started the Methodist Church, yes. in his writings believed in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Is that true? And if it is, why and when did the Methodist Church change their belief? Thank you, Judy. Good question. Uh, John Wesley did believe in a form of the doctrine of the real presence. And the Methodist Church has not, uh, you know, uh, rejected that. You can be a Methodist and you can affirm a form of the doctrine of the real presence. And the difficulty is, from a Catholic perspective, is twofold. First, we would say, well, that's good. There's a lot more to the real presence than, than Wesley's understanding of it. Wesley's understanding was essentially uh, very close to what we would understand the Lutherans to hold, a, a form that the Christ body and blood are present sort of in, with, and under the elements of bread and wine. And, and, and that's better than saying he's not present at all, but it, from our perspective, that's not the full body to understand in, the Eucharist. In fact, it, this is not true that the, the phrase real presence, mm -hmm. um, even in history, at times became a cop-out in a way. I mm -hmm. mean, people, rather than going all the way blood, right. body, blood, soul, and divinity, it became a, a, a way of compromising. It was a term used by many different groups to use many different things. Right. I think in the American context, or maybe the Anglo-American context, where we're often talking with non-Catholic Christians who are who really hold a, a purely symbolic understanding of the Eucharist. The Eucharist is just a symbol. The real presence is presented as the as the other other view, the alternate view, the more complete Catholic view. But when you study the, the Eucharistic doctrine very carefully, you'll see. There are different understandings of the real presence, and not all of them are fully compatible with the Catholic teaching. And so Wesley was closer to the Catholic view than a lot of other views, uh, but he didn't embrace the full understanding of the Eucharist in the way that Catholics would. The second issue is the question of how much latitude ought there to be in the community of the church with respect to issues like this. And the Catholic view of this is that this has really been resolved by the teaching authority. We're, we, we're not free to kind of you know, come up yeah. with our own ideas here. Well, the church, the Christ The church teaches this, but you know what I really think yeah, is true. That's I right. mean, that, that's God may say this, but this is what I think. You know, let me get him, <laughs> let me straighten you out on this Jesus type of thing. Um, let's grab this email because this is a, God, we got a nice, a nice flock of emails for us Great. tonight. Um, here's the question, Marcus. And Mark, how would you answer a Protestant 
who thinks it is okay to receive Holy Communion in a Catholic Church because they believe that it is the body and blood of Christ. This tags on to what you said. I was talking to a Pentecostal friend who personally believes that she receives Jesus when, re when she receives communion in her church, which I thought doesn't even teach that. Hmm. She seems to believe that it is okay to receive Holy Communion in the Catholic Church. Thank you and God bless. Well, what I would say is that I'm glad that she believes that the Eucharist is the real, true, substantial body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. That is great and that's wonderful and we share that because that's what we believe as Catholics. However, the Eucharist is also a sign of full unity in the church and in Christ. And so for a non-Catholic Christian, even if he believes in the real presence, to receive the Eucharist in the Catholic Church, unless, the, the only exception is made is, is really kind of a, a dire situation. He can't receive communion in his own church. This is the only, only circumstance that's available and, and so on. And that's not what we're talking about. For a, a non-Catholic Christian to ordinarily receive the Eucharist in the Catholic Church, even believing what the church teaches about the Eucharist, is really saying something that isn't true, namely that we have that level of unity in Christ and in the church that, that recognizes full communion, that we are fully one in sharing the same faith, not just about a Eucharist, but about everything, that we are fully united in what we believe about the sacraments and the sacraments we've received, that we are fully one in, in recognizing the authority of the Bishop of Rome and bishops in communion with him. That's really how a Catholic understands what's going on in the Eucharist when we come to receive Holy Communion, communion means union with. Yep. And we're saying we're not just being united with Jesus, but we're being united in with his body in its full Catholic sense. And unless a Protestant can say that, and he can't because then he wouldn't be a Protestant, he'd be a Catholic, it, w it would be less than completely honest for him to receive communion ordinarily under those circumstances. In fact, you can see it in the way that they treat communion after communion. Right. 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 The I mean, elements. The would, they f would they feel completely comfortable worshiping? Right. See, that's, the whole. A, that's a real dividing line. Yeah. Would you worship it? Do you, you treat it? You know, if it falls on the floor, right. you throw it in the wastebasket when it's done. I mean, I hate to tell you what I used to do right. with leftover the bread and right. we just ate it, you know, like it was for lunch. You right. know, the, the reality is how would you treat it afterwards? Right. That, but it's another fine subtlety here also. Right. We, it isn't the body and blood, soul, divinity of Jesus because we believe it to be. Right. That's nominalism. Right. We believe it to be because, because it, it is. is. Right. That's the difference. And there's a fine line there that's very, very significant. And that's not to take anything away from, you know, Protestants who, and yeah. there's much that we share in common there. All right, I think we may have one more email here. They're still searching around a little bit. We've got a bunch, but they're trying to find one great one here, unless we're almost running out of time. You know, okay. All right. You've been a Catholic now over 20 years. You even got some gray hair since <laughs> then. <laughs> <laughs> Becoming a Catholic. You didn't have a great, a great mustache when you <laughs> came right. into the church back in 1980 or so. Talk about how that journey has uh, influenced your relationship with Jesus. Well, as I said, you know, really, I became a Catholic because I felt like I needed to be a Catholic to be closer to Jesus. That his truth was taking me here. Uh, that the gifts he's given us in the sacraments were leading me to the Catholic Church. That the authority that he has established in the church, the shepherds, that he established uh, were, the, were the Catholic bishops and, and community of Bishop Rome. So for me, it's just, I don't see it as, well, being a Christian versus being a Catholic. I, you know, C.S. Lewis wrote this wonderful book, Mere Christianity, where he's talking about what's the basic commonality of all Christians. Well, that's a wonderful book, but uh, I, I, I want full Christianity, not mere Christianity, and that's really what I've come to see Catholicism as. And so it's really been just a deepening of my relationship with Christ, uh, growing closer to Him. Oh, I mean, I'm, I've learned a lot, you know, in terms of apologetics. I've, I've, I hope I've mellowed and, and become a little bit more uh, sophisticated and subtle, but all of that is really at, at the service of holiness and, and charity and uh, growing closer to God. And uh, I'm not going to say that, objectively speaking, I'm, I'm much holier than I was 20 years ago. I hope I am. But I will say this, I, I think I know, I think the gifts are there, and the opportunities are there, and the graces are there, and uh, I thank God. Well, Mark, thank you very much Marcus. for joining us on the journey home again. Wonderful. It's always a pleasure. Uh, and thank you for your apologetic work and your work with Ignatius Press. Uh, I, I do know that in our work in the Coming Home Network that we give a lot of books out to people on the journey, and I'm sure half of them are Ignatius Press books. Well, they're they're, they're fine work. books. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. 
for joining us on the journey home. Remember to keep Mother Angelica and the sisters at EWTN in your prayers. And also, let's remember our brothers and sisters who are right now making some very difficult decisions about their faith. Let's pray that they would see the fullness of the Catholic Church. God bless. I'll see you again next time.